All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Kenny said, I'm Mario Taylor, new spine surgeon with uh, Ortho Arizona here in the uh, East Valley. Uh, and today I'll be giving a presentation on minimally invasive uh, and robotic spine surgery. Next slide. Uh, start, we have uh, no, I have no disclosures, no reimburse, reimbursements or payments have been made, and I have no conflicts of interest. So just to give you a quick review, we'll kind of review some of the basic uh, goals of spine surgery in general. I'll go review some of the most common minimally invasive techniques, uh, as well as discuss uh, the uh, Globus uh, Excelsius GPS robot uh, and how it's able to kind of uh, integrate uh, multiple other uh, minimally invasive techniques and uh, how it uh, can be such a strong uh, and uh, powerful uh, device for, for uh, spine surgeon. Next slide. And then one more. All right, so Kenny kind of went over most of this, but just a quick review about myself. Uh, I did medical school at Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, followed by my residency training at University of Washington, Harborview Medical Center, uh, followed by my fellowship at UC San Diego. During my uh, residency training, minimally invasive surgery really wasn't a large portion of uh, our training. Uh, and uh, part of it was that we, you know, tended to uh, treat some more of the complex deformity cases, revision surgeries, and, and traumatic fractures that weren't as uh, commonly treated using a minimally invasive surgery. But during my fellowship at uh, UC San Diego, uh, one of the, you know, biggest draws was that we were able to treat those similar uh, issues, though we were uh, through uh, minimally invasive techniques, uh, kind of on a select basis, which I found extremely useful. So uh, first uh, to start, I'll kind of go over some of the basics, or one of the more uh, common patholo type of pathology that we treat in spine surgery being lumbar spondylosis. Uh, and in general, it can be thought of as a uh, overall degenerative changes that occur in the lumbar spine over time with age or as a result of an injury. Uh, what can occur is the intervertebral disc uh, will start to degenerate. The disc space will start to collapse. You can get uh, disc herniations or disc bulges. Uh, in addition to that, the facet joints can become uh, arthritic uh, with the formation of uh, osteophytes, uh, as well as leading to incompetency of the facet joint, which can lead to uh, a spondylolisthesis or a slippage uh, of one vertebral body on top of the other. Clinically, patients will uh, present with a number of different um, uh, signs or symptoms uh, with you know, low back pain, radiculopathy, neurogenic claudication, numbness, tingling, uh, or weakness. Uh, most patients are uh, able to be treated non for, but for the uh, uh, kind of small subset of patients that do require surgery, in general, we really have one to two goals uh, uh, for that specific patient. Next line. Uh, in general, uh, the main goals of spine surgery, as we discussed, are going to be uh, either decompression of the spinal nerve roots, which generally uh, what's causing the radiculopathy, numbness, tingling, or weakness, or stabilizing or straightening the vertebral segments uh, due to either instability uh, or defor uh, deformity. Now, traditionally, this was accomplished via the uh, posterior approach beginning around the uh, mid 1900s. As you can see from this illustration on the right here, uh, you know, we have more or less direct access to the spinous process and the lamina of the underlying uh, vertebral body. So there's not a lot of, there, there are many other structures kind of in between that area. The big, uh, or the main thing that you have to uh, kind of dissect and, and work around are the paraspinal musculature. And that, those paraspinal musculatures uh, are, uh, uh, present on either side of the spinous process uh, and are quite robust and strong uh, muscle groups. Those muscle groups do need to be retracted uh, throughout the entirety of the procedure. And that can oftentimes be associated with significant trauma um, uh, to, that mu uh, to those muscle bellies. Uh, that can lead to a number of different um, issues down the line for the patients. Next slide. Uh, so with this uh, illustration on the far left there, you can see we really do have to retract those uh, paraspinal musculatures a fair amount beyond the borders of, of the, the set joint and sometimes the transverse processes to be able to adequately visualize our, our working window. Um, 
to the far left as uh, kind of an illustration of how robust that those paraspinal musculature can be, as well as the additional soft tissue uh, that we need to uh, uh, work through and uh, leave retracted for the entirety of the procedure. Next slide. Uh, what that can result in uh, is uh, significant uh, atrophy of that muscle group. Uh, off to the right here, we have uh, what appears to be a, a healthy uh, uh, paraspinal musculature uh, with no signs of uh, fatty atrophy uh, or fatty replacement. While on the left, we have uh, a patient that uh, had a posterior spinal fusion through a more traditional approach uh, that has led to uh, necrosis and uh, fatty atrophy uh, of that uh, paraspinal musculature group bilaterally. So one of the main reasons why we've uh, why minimal invasive surgery has become uh, much more common is trying to decrease the approach related complications associated with the uh, traditional posterior approach. So it leads to decrease trauma to the muscle bellies. Avoid, uh, we're able to avoid detachment of any uh, tendons uh, and the deep fascia that provides stability uh, across the vertebral segments. And we're also able to limit the bony reception required uh, to access the spinal canal. What that leads to for our patients are de uh, is decreased pain, decreased opiate requirements, shorter length of stay, and fast recovery, all the while still being able to accomplish the primary goals of either decompressing the nerve roots or spinal cord, uh, while uh, simultaneously uh, stabilizing uh, the vertebral segments as necessary. Next slide. So some of the more common minimally invasive techniques that we'll talk about are the uh, pos posterior tubular techniques, uh, uh, percutaneous pedicle screw uh, instrumentation, uh, the lateral lumbar MRI fusion, MIS T-lift, uh, and briefly discuss the endoscopic uh, T-lift and endoscopic uh, uh, decompressive type procedures. So the first step uh, is the uh, our tubular techniques. Uh, using this technique, we're able to make you know, one to two centimeter incisions uh, off the midline of the, uh, one to two centimeters off midline uh, and using a series of progressively uh, enlarging uh, uh, dilators, we're able to provide a direct access to the anatomic landmarks that we need to uh, uh, address. Uh, so we usually start with the smallest inner dilator and progressively work our way up to uh, di uh, uh, dilator that's usually about uh, 22 to 26 uh, millimeters uh, uh, in diameter. And instead of having to retract that entire uh, periscopic musculature beyond the confines of beyond the borders of the set joint, we're able to you know create a, a, a focal kind of corridor more uh, direct towards that anatomic landmark. Our retraction of that muscle of the uh, muscle belly is much more focal uh, and just in the area that um, we'll be planning to work. Uh, those, uh, the final tube is then connected to a rigid arm that's connected to the bed. So that our, uh, tube is able to kind of stay uh, steady exactly in the, the working core that we require. Uh, then a light source is able to be uh, attached to, uh, the, um, to the dilator and uh, for improved visualization uh, uh, deep into the uh, structure. Next slide. Uh, this is just another uh, illustration of that. Uh, what it shows is that we are able to uh, not only access uh, and work at the spinal canal on the ipsilateral side that we've uh, made the incision, where we are actually able to undercut the spinous process and undercut the lamina of the contralateral side and still be able to decompress nerve roots on the other side as well. Uh, this is just another illustration of that, being able to access across the contralateral side. Next, we have percutaneous pelvic screw placement. Uh, this technique is, you know, uses uh, the same concept as the tubular techniques, using uh, a one to two millimeter, or excuse me, one to two centimeter incisions off midline uh, bilaterally. We're able to create a, a correct a direct corridor to the starting point for the pedicle screw, and using either a, a trocar or a guide wire. We're able to uh, cannulate the pedicle into the vertebral body and then use uh, that uh, uh, device to guide our screw into the pedicle and vertebral body. Uh, this generally requires, uh, this is generally done under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. So you start with taking AP and switch to lateral, back to an AP, 
So it does require a fair amount of uh, a fair amount of X-ray uh, to uh, be able to do this safely. Um, and some of the limitations that you're you're uh, held by are uh, the the quality of the uh, X-ray tech that you'll be working with, uh, as well as uh, quality of the actual X-ray as you're uh, trying to kind of navigate your way from the uh, starting point into the vertebral body. Next slide. Uh, next thing, next uh, procedure, it's probably one of the more common many invasive techniques is the MIS T-lift procedure. Uh, kind of briefly discuss what the open T-lift procedure looks like to kind of give you a reference point. Uh, but essentially the uh, spinous processes and uh, lamina of the uh, working levels of your uh, decompression and fusion uh, are partially removed. Uh, generally the T-lift uh, inner body spacer is uh, placed uh, unilaterally from one side uh, into the disc space. Uh, the window that you're working in for uh, the T-lift procedure uh, includes, you know, the exig nerve root that's going to be more or less uh, above you while the traversing nerve root will be more medial to where you're uh, working. So you have a, you know, a reasonably sized window to try and uh, access the disc space. So it still can be difficult to ensure that you're doing an appropriate discectomy, uh, you know, removing enough of the disc material, both on your, on the ipsilateral side, as well as the contralateral side to allow for uh, placement of the graft as well as, or excuse me, placement of the spacer, as well as for placement of the um, uh, bone graft. So the uh, uh, MIS T-lift procedure, uh, utilizing the uh, uh, tubular dilators, uh, as you can see here off to the left, and once again, we use those same uh, technique of you know, sequentially dilating through the paraspinal musculature, avoiding having to retract that uh, entire muscle body while still giving us uh, access to the disc space. Generally, uh, this uh, uh, and your intervertebral spacer uh, will be either will be completed either first or excuse me will be completed before or after you place your uh, pedal screws. Uh, your pedal screws on the contralateral side will be placed percutaneously. Uh, once again, using those smaller one, two centimeter incisions right off the midline. Um, and then the, uh, uh, the uh, inner body spacer can be uh, placed into your disc space. Uh, the, one of the main limitations with this procedure are, uh, are your restrictions of uh, the size of the uh, space that, that you're actually able to place. As you can see here at the uh, uh, tubes that we work through are generally only about 22 to 26 millimeters uh, in diameter. So you can really only place something, uh, place something that is slightly smaller than that. In addition to that, as I mentioned before, the uh, anatomic window that you're working in to safely access the disk space is uh, kind of confined by the uh, fecal sac or the dural tube medial to yourself, the exiting nerve root above you, and then the pedicle of the tubal segment below you. So you really only have a couple uh, centimeters to be able to uh, safely get into the disc space, do your work, and uh, uh, remove safely as well. Um, so the size of the uh, T-lift antibody spaces can be uh, quite smaller than some of the other uh, spacers that we use. In addition to this, um, it can be quite easy to uh, get disoriented or kind of lose your uh, uh, lose track of your anatomic landmarks since you're working in this hollow tube with no reference point outside of exactly what you're looking at. So one of the keys to these uh, to this procedure is establishing your establishing yourself and your orientation based on some constant or consistent landmarks that you don't plan on changing or uh, removing during the actual portion of the procedure. Invasive uh, T-lift procedures have been around for uh, quite some time. I think they uh, were initially developed and introduced in around 2002 as an alternative, as an alternative to the open T-lift. Uh, and over time, uh, the techniques have uh, advanced and uh, kind of cha uh, have changed substantially. Um, this uh, uh, study uh, from two uh, excuse me from 2022 I looked at the short-term outcomes of MIS uh, versus open TLF procedures uh, the main outcomes that they were able that they measured were EBL 
uh, and surgery duration. Uh, they noted that uh, your EBL and surgery duration for the uh, open telic procedures uh, were uh, significantly uh, higher for the uh, open telics. The patient reported outcomes were uh, reasonably similar between the two groups uh, with long, uh, longer term outcomes that were uh, more or less equivocal as well. Uh, this secondary, uh, the second uh, study that we have is a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, it included about 26 studies uh, looking at um, uh, uh, MIS, um, million bases versus open lumbar fusion procedures. Uh, 26 studies were included with a total of uh, 856 MIS procedures, uh, or excuse me, 856 uh, MIS patients, and then uh, 100, uh, 806 uh, patients that underwent open procedures. Patients that had MIS uh, surgery had uh, less blood loss uh, by an average of about 260 cc's and a shorter length of stay by about two to three days. Uh, the reoperation rate, non union rate were not substantially different between the two, uh, with patient reported outcomes that were slightly better uh, for uh, the MIS group subset. Uh, next procedure that uh, we'll talk about is the lateral lumbar inner body fusion. Uh, and uh, this uh, procedure kind of bypasses one of the uh, main limitations of uh, the MIS T lift procedure, and that you're allowed, you're able to use a much larger uh, intervertebral uh, spacer device. Uh, as you can see, the uh, I kind of place some values of the average sizes of some of the spacers that we'll use for laterals versus uh, T lifts. Uh, and while the laterals aren't quite double the size, you know, they're kind of ten, ten, uh, trending towards that. So that allows us to kind of have a different treatment philosophy uh, using the lateral lumbar intervite fusions. Because these lateral lumbar, uh, the, the lateral cages are uh, substantially larger, there's a larger surface area across the vertebral segments. So there's a larger uh, surface area for fusion, uh, decreased risk for subsidence uh, of the uh, graft, uh, as well as increased stability across that segment. Uh, additionally, uh, we're able to use the concept of indirect decompression. Uh, what that means is by using a, a larger graft, uh, once we're able to kind of uh, increase the interrotable height to its baseline or uh, slightly beyond that, uh, what the graft does is actually retentions the uh, annulus and the ligamentum flavum posteriorly. The annulus is generally uh, either um, bulged or, or uh, herniated in one way, shape, or form, uh, and the ligament and flavum will frequently be uh, buckled or uh, redundant upon itself, uh, causing uh, central stenosis. So by increasing the vertebral disc height, uh, we're able to retention the annulus, retention the uh, ligament and flavum, and allow for uh, opening of the central canal. Uh, so this kind of shows a good illustration of that off the left in uh, illustration A. Uh, we can see uh, uh, illustration of uh, spondylolisthesis. Uh, there is slight disc bulge. You have a uh, redundant ligamentum flavum, off the combination of which uh, cause narrowing of the spinal canal. Uh, at the illustration B uh, is more in line with what a T-lift procedure may look like. You have a smaller inner uh, vertebral uh, disc device. Uh, you have direct, uh, uh, in the telus procedure, we're directly looking at the areas of stenosis and directly removing uh, either ligament or bone that's causing the stenosis and or uh, uh, compression around those nerves. Uh, and then with illustration C, we can see that we have a much larger uh, uh, interrotubal device. The posterior annulus is retentioned and, and no longer redundant and kind of uh, protruding into the the uh, uh, central canal uh, and the ligamentum flavum and also uh, retention and no longer buckling upon itself. Additionally, we don't need to always directly um, uh, take down uh, the bone or, or soft tissues uh, around the spinal canal. It can allow for opening of the canal just enough to uh, relieve patient symptoms. Um, they're still trying to, uh, or excuse me, I guess myself, I'm still trying to figure out uh, the the ideal situations uh, or the ideal patients that would benefit most from this uh, procedure as in uh, using the indirect decompression technique um, because it does leave the chance of, uh, you know, patients have lingering and or uh, recurrent symptoms since we're not directly taking down 
uh, the kind of offending area and the posterior aspect of the spine, but it still avoids having to, um, uh, uh, directly remove those segments, directly remove that, uh, that bone that may be causing stenosis, uh, and can lead to, uh, you know, a little bit easier recovery for, uh, some of the patients. So, uh, next briefly review, uh, robots and other aspects of surgery, as some of you are familiar, uh, with the Da Vinci, uh, surgery robot, uh, which has been, uh, in the market for a number of years, uh, frequently used for general surgery, urology, ob guy, and a number of other specialties as well. The Mako, uh, robotic, uh, the Mako robot, uh, is common or used in, um, arthroplasty, both total hips and total knees. Uh, and both of these robots are slightly different from each other and slightly different from the, the Globus robot in that the Da Vinci robot, the surgeon is actually re slightly remote from the patient working at a console, looking into a screen uh, and manipulating uh, hand controls that then uh, uh, directly uh, interact with the patient within the surgical field. Uh, the Mako robot has a robotic arm that moves in the correct ori orientation and the correct trajectory of uh, uh, that the surgeon uh, requires for uh, either a total knee or a total hip uh, portion of the procedures. The Globus uh, Excelsius uh, robot is a little bit more along the lines of the Mako robot. I'm not quite uh, as similar with the Da Vinci robot. So some of the um, uh, limitations with some of the other uh, procedures that we talked about, including the percutaneous uh, pedicle screw placement, the MIS T lift, is that you know you do need to use a significant amount of fluoroscopy, uh, which leads to radiation exposure to both the patient, but also to the surgeon and the operating room team. Uh, for the patient, it may only be you know uh, instance where they're uh, being exposed to this radiation, you know once or twice or in their lifetime, but for the uh, operating room team, this is something that's occurring to them you know, day in, day out, multiple cases, uh, multiple times during the day. So this first study was a retrospective review published in uh, 2002 out, out of the HSS, and it compared robotic to navigation for one to two level MIS T-lift procedure, where the primary outcomes uh, being comparing uh, radiation exposure, uh, fluoro time, uh, radiation dose, and total OR time. Uh, they included about 244 patients, uh, 111 of which were robotic, and 133 of which were navigation-based. And they noted that uh, there were total floor time, total ra radiation dose uh, were less for the robotic cases as compared to the navigation-based systems, while the total OR time uh, were uh, similar between both groups. Uh, this next study looked at the uh, complication revi and revision rates uh, for uh, many invasive robotic guided versus fluoroscopic guided uh, spinal fusions. Uh, freehand pedicle screw placement guided either by guided by a fluoroscopy is kind of the uh, uh, standard or tra traditional technique that uh, most uh, surgeons were using. Uh, and this study was a multi-center uh, perspective study comparing the complication revision, revision rates for spinal. Uh, fusions for patients that had their pedicle screws placed with the Medtronic uh, Maser robot uh, or uh, had uh, floor guided freehand uh, technique. It included about nine sites, 485 patients, 347 of which were robotic, uh, and 111 of which were uh, a freehand and fluoroscopic. Uh, for, uh, fluoroscopy time. Uh, during the surgery per screw was substantially less for the robotic uh, uh, robot, patients that had a robotic surgery compared to patients that had a freehand surgery uh, with total uh, radiation exposure, once again, being less for the robotic compared to the flor uh, fluoroscopic um, technique. Next slide. Uh, and then this, uh, another study, uh, robotic study looking at the safety of uh, using robotic or navigated uh, uh, pedicle screws versus uh, fluoroscopic freehand screws. Uh, systematic review and meta-analysis published this year out of uh, University of Cincinnati included um, uh, 14 studies, uh, eight, 892 patients, and almost or a little, slightly more than 4,000 screws. Uh, 
the main outcome measures that they looked at were the odds ratio to estimate uh, the accuracy of pedicle screw placement, as well as the relative risk for various surgical complications. Uh, what they were able to find is that with the patients that underwent uh, robotic or navigation-based surgery, uh, they had higher odds of uh, uh, correct, accurate screw placement, as well as decreased risk of uh, facet joint violation, as well as for decreased risk of um, lower risk of uh, intraoperative uh, major complications. Overall, though, there are no difference between uh, the two groups for uh, return to the operating room for screw revision, uh, which I thought was uh, quite interesting. Uh, and then this last study we have, I have is a slight, uh, slightly uh, more recent study this year out of the European Spine Journal study published out of China. Uh, it compared the safety and accuracy of pedicle screws uh, using three different techniques. The first being uh, the robotic technique, second being O-arm, which is uh, O-arm based navigation, uh, and the third being freehand uh, floral based navigation, uh, excuse me, uh, freehand floral um, technique. So there are about 106 patients in total. 32 of which underwent uh, uh, robotic surgery, 34 underwent uh, O-arm based navigation, and 40 underwent uh, uh, freehand or fluoroscopic guided technique. Uh, and they determined that the uh, uh, patients that underwent robotic surgery, uh, pedicle screw accuracy was about 96%, O-arm uh, placement was about 93%, uh, and a freehand, freehand technique had accuracy about 80%. Uh, this is more or less in line with uh, some of the other uh, studies uh, that have been published about uh, accuracy of robotics um, uh, navigation and uh, versus uh, for freehand fluoroscopic guided. I do think the fluoroscopic guided uh, percentage is slightly lower. Generally, I've seen uh, the robotic uh, accuracy usually being about uh, 96 to 98 uh, percent, the navigation being anywhere from 92 to 94 uh, percent, and the uh, fluoroscopic uh, freehand being anywhere from like 88 to, to 90 percent or so. Next slide. So for the uh, Globus GBS robot, uh, some of the uh, large benefits in the overall workflow that are beneficial and uh, helpful for a surgeon are uh, most patients will obtain a, a CT scan uh, preoperatively. Um, that CT scan can then be uploaded into the system prior to even uh, starting the case or prior to the surgery. So that allows you to be able to pre-plan exactly where you wanna put your screws at your working levels and clearly have an idea uh, of where those screws are going to go prior to entering the operating room. An additional thing that uh, uh, makes the robot uh, particularly useful is that you know uh, multiple uh, many other um, navigation systems or robotic systems have this reference array, uh, which is that four pronged uh, four pronged uh, device in the bottom left. Uh, that uh, is what the camera of the system will be referencing to the anatomic structures within the body. Other navigation systems, other robotic systems, if for whatever reason the reference, or, reference, or, reference array was hit or bumped or moved in one way, shape, or form, the accuracy of the system will be thrown off substantially. And the issue comes in is when the surgeon or the OR team is not aware that that change or that uh, loss of accuracy accuracy has occurred. So the Globus robot has the uh, surveillance marker, which is the single pronged or the single kind of ball uh, next to the uh, reference array. And that actually tracks the reference array and makes sure it uh, gives you a, a feedback uh, of whether or not the reference array has moved in one way or not. If it has been moved, instead of requiring another OR SIM or another intraoperative CT scan that can be required with some of the other systems, uh, the Globus robot allows you to check another uh, AP and lateral uh, x-ray and then use that in addition to the uh, CT scan to kind of recalibrate itself uh, in your operating room once again while avoiding having to do uh, another intraoperative CT scan. Click. Um, so as I mentioned, the pre-planning uh, aspect of the uh, robot is uh, particularly useful. Um, so you can kind of place your screws visually on the screen uh, as you need uh, prior to starting the case. 
you can make any changes to those screws while you're in the case because uh, uh, you're able to kind of steadily prep the screen and some of the other aspects of the robot. Uh, hit next for me one more time, sorry. There you go. So yeah, that's kind of visual what the, the uh, screen will look like. It's fairly straightforward. You're able to kind of translate the screw you know, in all directions as well as angulate it one way or the other as necessary. And then once again, So uh, the robotic arm uh, is a rigid arm uh, that helps kind of uh, uh, place your places itself in the correct trajectory of your uh, pre-planned screw uh, that is controlled using a foot pedal by the surgeon during the case. You select the screw that you plan to uh, instrument, uh, uh, push on the foot pedal, uh, robotic arm then slowly moves into the correct trajectory. Uh, and as that robot, robotic arm is moving into the correct trajectory, there's a tracker on the screen that uh, allows you to see uh, in real time that the accuracy is correct and that it hasn't changed until that robotic arm gets into its correct place, uh, correct alignment. If for whatever reason, while you're placing that uh, uh, placing the robotic arm. If you were to move the patient or where the patient were to move, you'll see, you'll get an alert on the screen that tells you that the, the orientation and the relationship between the robotic arm and the patient and the reference ray has changed. So you'll need to place plus the robot again, the, the pedal again, and the pedal will actually micro adjust itself to correct for the uh, small movement that had occurred. Uh, the next thing that's quite useful is the real-time visualization. Um, one more, uh, forward one more time, sorry, uh, is the real-time visualization. Uh, so not only can you directly uh, place those screws exactly where you want them, as you're actually placed in the screws, you can see where those screws are going uh, without, uh, uh, and match that up with where you kind of initially planned it. The other uh, uh, benefit of this is uh, for use during inner body, um, uh, inner body device placement. Uh, as I had mentioned, when you're doing the MIS T lift procedures, sometimes it can be quite difficult to ensure that, that, or to be sure that you're getting all the disc material from the contralateral side of the disc, whether it's the uh, uh, posterior contralateral side or the far uh, anterior corner, uh, this uh, uh, system will allow you to directly visualize where your uh, discectomy tools are going and ensure that you kind of get those uh, harder, harder to reach access points. In addition to that, with the lateral lumbar antibody fusion, as you saw from the illustration, the uh, uh, lateral lumbar uh, devices, as you're placing it across the uh, disc space, uh, you have the spinal canal posterior to you and then anterior to that, you have your aorta and IVC, uh, both of which can be somewhat variable in their orientation to the vertebral body. Um, so you know, that can allow you to, uh, in your mind, have a clear sense that you're truly going straight across the um, uh, the intervertebral disc and not deviating an uh, anteriorly towards you know the abdomen and some of the great vessels, and not deviating posteriorly towards the spinal canal. And so, uh, I think that the the, the Globus robot and GPS uh, system has been uh, uh, great has done a great job of kind of integrating uh, some of the. Uh, multiple aspects of minimally invasive surgery, all the while kind of bypassing some of the limitations that each of those procedures have. Uh, uh, it's not going to be, you know, a long-term or not going to be a replacement for surgeons or, or, or uh, spine surgeons, but can act as a, a useful tool and, and adjunct for uh, any spine surgeon. Thank you all for your time. Uh, if you have any other questions, uh, please feel free.